Hi, this is Fred Sroka with Golden Gate University. Today's November 17, 2017, and I'm here with Barry Brintz from BDO. Barry, thanks so much for joining our adjunct faculty, and thank you for joining me today to try to summarize what we know <laughs> of with respect to flow-throughs. Thank you so much, Fred. I'm really happy to be here. I understand you just finished a few days of an off-site talking about what this new tax legislation might look like. That's right, and there's a lot of talk, and you know, I think one of the takeaways is that there's a lot of uncertainty right now. I think it's fair to say that when all is said and done, much more will have been said than done. <laughs> we don't pretend to be able to say what the new law is or whether anything will pass. Um, what we do hope to do, though, is help our alumni, help our students and our adjuncts understand what we're seeing so far and if there are concrete actions that we might want to take before the end of the year? Well, exactly, yeah. I think that, uh, you know, I think that when it comes to the year in tax planning, this is something that you want to have on your mind. Uh, you don't necessarily need to uh, make decisions based on this, but I think you should have an awareness of what uh, Congress is proposing for tax reform. Exactly. Um, let's start on in and see where we get to with respect to flow throughs. The single biggest change that we expect to see is the reduction in tax on small business. So as I take a look at the way pass-through income is being taxed, the backdrop that I've heard is that both Republicans and Democrats were strongly in favor of reducing C-Corp tax rates. However, the small business lobby was adamantly opposed to having Home Depot have a lower rate than the local Ace Hardware store. And so this is an attempt to say we're going to give some concessions over to smaller flow-through businesses. Is that consistent with what you've heard? You know, I think that's exactly right, is that you'll have some very large S corporations that are competing uh, with multinational C corporations. And uh, if you have provisions that are really geared towards C corporation tax reduction, you know, it could put the S corporations at a disadvantage. So some of these provisions that we're seeing are intended to sort of minimize the disadvantage for S corporations. Exactly. So as we take a look at what is currently proposed out of Senate finance, what we see is instead of a lower tax rate, you get an additional nominal deduction, right? That's right. Uh, and the 17.4% deduction is sort of a rough justice approach. Uh, you'll see as we start, when we look at the... Uh, uh, at the House side, they have more of a safe harbor where they've divided the income into, into you know, two different buckets. So um, this is the Senate's version, is the single 17.4% deduction. Exactly, and it would apply to any business income, not your investment type income, capital gains, or anything like that, but it applies whether you get a Schedule C, so you, you're a sole proprietor, or whether you're an S Corp or a partnership, right? Well, that's that right, yes, one. that's right. Cool. And then I thought the Senate version said, but your foreign income doesn't count towards this, that it's only your domestic income. Does that ring a bell to you? Uh, that is right. That is right. It, it's focused on the domestic ordinary income. Got it. And then the other thing that I thought was distinctive about the Senate was that limitation of 50% of, of your W-2 wages. So if I have a business, but I'm pretty much the only person working in there, I'm not going to get much of a benefit. If you have a business, but you employ a couple hundred workers, you save a whole bunch of tax. That's right. Cool. Yeah. So the, the Senate version seems to be focused on helping small businesses that employ a bunch of people do better. And then they limit that for doctors, lawyers, what we view as uh, the professional services industry. And they have a very broad list, if I remember correctly. But they don't pick winners and losers, friends and enemies. <laughs> That's right. So consulting firms, accounting firms, engineering firms, a lot, all of the service line industries uh, would be exempt from this. Exactly. Now let's go to the House version, and I think what we see is a very different approach. Could you briefly walk us through the sure. features of the House? Sure. So with the, the House version, what they've done is they've sort of created a maximum 25% rate on the pass-through income, um, and they've, they've left it up to the S Corporation shareholders, or I guess the pass-through share owners, to uh, determine what portion of the income would be subject to that 25% rate, uh, it's it's uh, sort of the capital portion, and then all of the rest uh, would be just considered the regular flow-through income that's subject to tax at the ordinary income rates. So um, one of the things that they do with the house version is that they create a safe harbor. It's a 30%, 70% safe harbor. And under that safe harbor, um, 
an S corporation shareholder could say, okay, well, 30% of my uh, S corporation income is attributable to capital, uh, is capital income, and is subject to this 25% rate. Exactly. Now, doctors get that safe harbor, but lawyers and accountants don't, if I remember correctly. <laughs> That's right. Once again, there's an exclusion for the service lines of business. So if you're a service business, again, an accounting firm, a consulting firm, uh, uh, you will not get that benefit. Uh, that you would otherwise get. Or I'd have to prove it, right? I'd have to show that I'm really not getting paid for my services, that I'm passive, or I didn't work 500 hours or something like that. Well, that's right, that's right. I guess you still, it, you, you do have the opportunity to prove it. And one of the ways um, uh, you can prove either by, by saying that you're not passive, that you're not passive, but there's also a way, if you choose to forego the, uh, the safe harbor, there's also another way to prove your capital percentage. Um, and there, it, you know, to the extent that you're able to show that your income is attributable to capital as opposed to services. Yeah. Then when you take a look at passive owners and whether or not they can simply say, I should be entitled to it regardless of my safe harbor. Um, I'm a retired from a big four firm. And so I would argue, well, I'm certainly passive right now. So I'd wonder if I wouldn't be entitled to this rate, which might be a nice thing, right? Oh, that's right, exactly, yes. And then I've got probably former partners who would argue, no, nah, Fred didn't work 500 hours a year back when he was an active partner, so <laughs> who knows where the rate will come out on that one. Yeah. But thank you. So there is an opportunity for flow-through income that is business income to instead of being really penalized the way we do it today with top tax rates plus SE or NII, but maybe we wind up with actually much more favorable rate saving as much as 14% or so, right? That's right, yeah. I mean, so I think that this is, a, this is good news for pass-through owners. Not quite the half off that we get with C-Corps, but a pretty substantial savings. Cool, so as we're taking a look at that, we're gonna be talking about what action should our clients take. That's clearly the big change, but in running through very briefly, you're really a specialist with S-Corps. I do an awful lot of partnership stuff. Um, we really want to talk about what else do we need to make sure we discuss with our clients. What do you see go wrong as we go through year-end planning? Mm -hmm. So could I ask you to do a real quick tour of what else you talk about with your clients as you get towards the end of the year? You know, absolutely. Uh, I am in the transaction services group at BDO, and we do a lot of due diligence on S corporations. And so uh, we do see sort of the same mistakes being made over and over again with regard to the S corporation status. So I thought it might be a good idea to sort of focus on what some of the more common traps are for the unwary. And, you know, and this, the end of year is a great time if you're a tax advisor for S corporations to sort of go back and do a little bit of house cleaning and make sure that, that you have sort of the affairs in order of your S corporation clients. Um, one of the first things that I would recommend would be to find your S election. You know, S the S election is made on Form 2553. Uh, if you don't have that, then you can call the IRS and they will, uh, they have a specialty tax line and they will get a copy of the S election to you. Right, and if you goofed up and didn't mail it in, they're really generous in the first three years in change, right, of saying, oops, I wish I had, but I thought you could go for a private letter ruling even after three years, can't you? Well, I believe, yes, that's right. And, um, I, you know, I think that this is one of the things, too, where, you know, there is relief available, but you need to find it fairly shortly after the S election is made. Right, so if you've got a problem, for Pete's sake, solve it. Don't do the ostrich approach and wait to be caught. <laughs> that's the key. That's the key. And, and once you've got that Form 2553, I think one of the first things that you want to look at is you want to make sure that, uh, you want to check the effective date and make sure that you have uh, that your S election was effective uh, when you intended it to be effective. Um, you can, as you know, you can make a retroactive election up to two years or two months and 15 days after the intended effective date, mm -hmm. or, or you can make a prospective election so that it would go into effect um, if you, you could in the immediately following tax year. Cool. And then the big thing is check your shareholders and make sure that the whole time you've been an S that you've had qualified shareholders, right? Exactly. So and, and, and when it comes to shareholders, one other point I'd just like to point out that we, we do see often. Um, it's important that you're, if, if you're in a community property state, it's important that both spouses sign the S election. We see that missed very often. It's actually not, uh, last I looked, it wasn't on the form itself, but it's in the instructions. Yeah, kind of scary, right? I had three California guys who had worked together since college and we did an S election but one of them had married a Canadian woman 
And thank goodness she was a resident, but you know where you look at that and go, oh darn, that could be scary. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Cool, and then no corporations and no partnerships, right? That's right. Exactly. So we wanna make sure that we've got qualifying shareholders. We can't get over 100, but I've never had a problem with that limitation. If I have 200, can't I just form two S-Corps and have a partnership down underneath? Uh, yeah, exactly, that yeah. would be the way around that rule. Right, so um, think ahead, you shouldn't have a problem, and more importantly, it, you got to find people who are related to one another and so that's Those right are there are a lot of special one. rules when it comes to families um, if, if, it, if I could there's one other point I'd like to point out when it comes to um, the uh, shareholder eligibility and that's sure. when you have trusts as your shareholders uh, if you are a tax advisor for an S corporation and you have uh, QSSTs or ESBT trusts as your shareholders you might want to go back and just make sure that you have valid elections for those trusts as well. Um, you know, we see that missed a lot, and it's very important because you don't want to have any ineligible shareholders. Got it. And the QSST, if I remember correctly, that's kind of like the old Q-tip trust. Mom gets the income for life, and then the remainder goes to the kid. Exactly. With the QSST, you have to have only, the income has to be directed towards one beneficiary. Um, and another point with that is that all of the income has to be distributed annually with the QSST. And so that requires some communication between the S corporation and the beneficiary. Yeah, trusts are complicated, but the other one you mentioned, the electing small business trust, I thought that was kind of like, good news, you can have almost anybody be a beneficiary, you can have multiple beneficiaries, bad news, you pay tax at a ridiculously high rate on everything. That's right. So you could have a foreigner somewhere up above, but you'd have to pay a ton of tax in order to be able to do that. Cool. Well, let's talk about the other big uh, challenge that we see, which is the one class of stock rule. Could you briefly walk through what we need to do to make sure we qualify there? Exactly. Uh, one of the uh, defining characteristics of an S corporation is that you can only have one class of stock. And um, when it come, one of the first things that you want to look to to make sure that you have a single class of stock uh, and they point to this in the regulations, is that you want to look at your governing provisions. So, and make sure that the governing provisions are clean. Uh, if your governing provisions are clean, and by governing provisions, we're talking about articles, uh, your articles of incorporation and any other bylaws, any other governing documents. Don't we have trouble though? A lot of LLCs wind up saying, oh, I want to be a corporation, I want to be an S Corp. The IRS is really nice and says you only need to file the form 2553, but Gee, a lot of the language in LLC operating agreements does crazy stuff like payout based on capital accounts. Isn't that kind of a scary risk? Yeah, and that can be a real gotcha for taxpayers or, or for tax advisors. If you are converting an LLC into an S corporation, you really want to go back and, and read your operating agreements. Uh, read them very carefully for the language to make sure that they aren't creating a second class of stock. Plan B, we simply add another amendment saying whatever our other agreements say, everybody gets a rateable share based on this percentage of all distributions, no matter what. Right? Perfect. Yeah, I think sometimes blunt justice is easier than careful <laughs> analysis. <laughs> I think that's perfect. You know that one class of stock rule doesn't apply to voting rights, so you can give your kids class B stock that doesn't vote. It's the distributions, right, that we're really concerned about? That's right, exactly. And you know, some, uh, some advisors can use this as a uh, planning tool, say if an S corporation owner sort of wants to phase out of the S corporation slowly, uh, they can provide uh, you know, a new acquirer, new management, they can give them non-voting uh, shares in the stock while the exiting, exiting owner retains the voting shares of stock. So you maintain control, but you're giving over a share of the distributions, exactly. as long as that's readable. And then I've seen planners try to kind of dodge around the edges of the one class of stock rule by doing things like either paying out bonuses, by having debt instruments where I'll only put in one dollar of equity, but then I want to get a priority return, so I'll contribute a million dollars of debt. Yeah. Um, when do we get in trouble there? When do we feel like we're in a safe harbor? Yeah, I think you know the key with that is if you if it's at all possible, you want to stick within the safe harbor. Uh, the uh, Treasury regulations provide three safe harbors, one for um, straight debt, one for open advance, open advances. Now those are advances between the shareholder uh, and the S corporation of less than $10,000. And finally for proportionate loans. Um, if you cannot uh, fall within the safe harbor, then what would happen is you would have to do sort of a traditional debt versus equity analysis to determine whether or not um, uh, whether or not this 
reported debt was actually equity. And if it was determined that this was equity rather than debt, then you would look at the principal purpose. Uh, you'd do sort of a, a second analysis, which would involve the principal purpose of issuing this purported debt. Exactly. And then I've seen people, if you can't have the right kind of structure of debt and equity, or you're scared of it in the S-Corp, the S-Corp might go down into an LLC, and there might be a non-pro rata sharing down at the LLC level. Right. But again, that's got to be a bona fide entity, otherwise... Right. Maybe it all gets collapsed. Exactly, exactly. And how about stock options, warrants, other ways of trying to say, I'm going to give you a little bit more return than me, even though our shareholdings are equal? Yeah, so that's an interesting one. I think with the stock options and warrants, there's a you, you would want to look at the distribution rights and the characteristics. Uh, stock options and warrants don't necessarily create a second class of stock. But one thing that you want to, you want to be careful of is, uh, I have seen cases where stock options and warrants have been issued without, uh, without good controls by the S Corporation and have resulted in more than 100, and, and the S Corporation losing its S status because they had more than 100 shareholders. Oh, okay. So that's just another thing to keep in mind if you've got an S Corporation with stock options. Wonderful, that makes sense. So now let's say that we actually have a good S Corp. Um, so we feel like we met the 100 shareholder, everybody's a qualifying shareholder, and we make all our distributions rateably based on shares. Perfect. Uh, let's talk about other things that go wrong, and let's begin with, I was a C-Corp, because if I wasn't a C-Corp before, there aren't all that many things you can goof up with an S-Corp. Yeah, if you but, start from inception, that's right. Exactly. Could you walk us through the built-in gains tax, what you ought to be thinking about there? Yeah, exactly. I think one of the things that I would recommend is, as you're going through your year-end house cleaning, is look at your history of your corporation, of your S corporation. And if it was previously a C corporation, um, then you may have to contend with the built-in gain tax under Section 30, uh, 1374. And the way the built-in gain tax works is that you would look at the um, any net unrealized built-in gain in your assets. Uh, that existed in your assets on the date of your the effective date of your election. That's new big to all our friends, right? That's right. <laughs> you would look at your new big, and you would, um, to the extent that you any of those assets were sold or distributed in what's called the recognition period, which is a five year period after the S election is made, you may be in a position where you would have to recognize gain at the entity level. Now this is new, um, no, not new, but this is. Uh, perhaps unusual, this is one of the few cases where an S corporation uh, is taxed at the entity level, and it's taxed at the highest corporate rate, so you would be paying a 35% tax rate uh, if you're subject to this 1374 tax. Right, now if you do it right, you shouldn't pay that tax, right? Don't sell the assets that you held that had appreciation would be rule number one. That's right, and this is, uh, this is an opportunity mm -hmm. where you can do some tax planning because it's a uh, if you plan to sell assets that have appreciation, you can also sell loss assets so that you can offset the gain. Right. They probably have to be loss assets that you held at the time of conversion, though? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. And then finally, couldn't I just pay myself a big bonus and crater the taxable income? To, exactly. That's a limit, I thought, also. No, that's exactly right. So there are some ways around this. Got it. So if you're smart, you can wait the five years before triggering gain and hopefully then avoid double tax even on the appreciation that occurred before S. That's right. Now, and one thing I would also keep in mind with this, uh, with this built-in gain tax is you want to look at your state law to see uh, there are some states that, don't, uh, that haven't adopted the five-year recognition period, and so you may be subject to a 10-year recognition period at the state level. You know, I practiced law, so I always said, I'm only talking about federal, but really, <laughs> as an accountant, you need to deal with state also. <laughs> um, you know, as we take a look at the money coming out of S-Corps, it's funny how when I teach this stuff, students are constantly confused as to the difference in rules among the different types of entities. And I keep trying to argue that actually the rules aren't all that different. So if I begin with partnerships over on the right-hand side, this is kind of a goofy slide. You have to read it right to left, kind of like Hebrew. Um, partnerships are pretty straightforward. Distributions come out of basis up to the total amount of the partner's basis. After that, all distributions are capital gain. You know, in the corporate tax class, people get hopelessly confused, but it's pretty much the same thing, except that there's one more layer, which is to the extent the C-Corp has either current or accumulated earnings and profits, well, first distributions are treated as a dividend up to that amount. But after that, it's exactly the same as partnerships. 
Well, it's exactly the same for cash, but if I distribute property, darn, that triggers the gain on the property. Right. But you distribute out no tax to the shareholder up to their basis. Everything after that is capital gains. So surprisingly, the rules aren't all that dramatically different. Could you please walk us through S-Corps? Because when you think about it, they kind of sort of fit. Yeah, no, and this is a great slide, Fred, because it kind of shows all of the elements that go into uh, uh, taxing distributions for an S-Corporation. And um, so you would start with your AAA, and that's sort of your, as your, as your you know, income, as the S-Corporation income flows into the S-Corporation and up to the shareholders, it creates triple, a AAA balance. Um, for the S corporation, and you need to be obviously be tracking your AAA balance. Uh, the next layer is your earnings and profits, uh, and this is one where really is only applicable to the extent that you your S corporation was previously a C corporation, or it acquired a C corporation in a non recognition transaction. And more importantly, and it made money while it was a C corp, and most importantly, and it didn't distribute that <laughs> as a dividend. Yet. Yes, yes, that's right. Um, and you know, and once you've eaten through those two layers, that's where you come to the S shareholders uh, uh, basis, um, and then any any distributions in excess of basis uh, would be capital gains. And I would also just want to add that you can uh, there are elections that you can make that you can reverse the ordering here so that you could actually distribute first from EMP and then from your AAA balance. Got it. Which again, if I thought that I needed to clean up my EMP for some reason might be a nice election to make. So let's talk about why I might want to clean up uh, EMP. And we begin with what happens on the Form 1120S when we've got previously taxed income. So we got that little reconciliation on our Form 1120S. And the bottom right-hand box is called PTI. Could you tell us what is that number and why are we worried about it? Well, actually, Fred, I'm going to let you go through the PTI slide here, if that's okay. And oh, of course. Well, um, to the extent that we have undistributed C Corp earnings and profits, we should be tracking that on our 1120S. And it causes us a bunch of concerns. The first one is that, as Barry just ran through, if our current year distributions are more than our total current year S Corp income, the shareholder's rateable share would be their portion of the AAA accumulated adjustments account, well, then we're going to be triggering dividends, right, up to the amount of that PTI. But we got more concerns than that. Um, if we have an S Corp that never paid out that dividend back when it was a C Corp, so we haven't paid our double tax yet, and we stay really active, so we're still running the business, Congress is totally okay with that. The IRS is totally okay with that. But if, eh, dad is mostly retiring and so most of the income winds up becoming passive, then Congress gets a little bit edgy and says, come on, why didn't you pay out that C Corp dividend? We're not going to wait forever. So Code Section 1375 says, wait a minute, if your total passive income for the current year exceeds 25% of That's your right. gross receipts, right. am I getting close? <laughs> That's Wonderful. Exactly. Then what we're going to do is we're going to hit you with a tax on the excess over 25%. So all that interest in dividend income, you get hit with a little penalty tax. And I think it's computed 25% times the net passive income that you have over 25% of your total gross receipts. That's right? right. Yeah, you get your deductions spread over using the peanut butter rule in there. And then finally, if you blow that off for three years or more, so you're over this limit, then code section 1362 comes in and says, you're a jerk, you should have paid that out, <laughs> therefore we're going to disqualify your S election, right? Yeah, and so this is again one that you really need to be aware of, I think, um, uh, because it, you know the S election is at stake here. Wonderful. So I think knowing that what we have to monitor is for five years after we make an S election, we need to worry about the stuff that we never paid the first corporate tax on. That's the built-in gains under 1374. Right. And then the stuff that we earned while we were a C corporation that we never paid the second tax on, the dividends. That's 1375, the potential disqualification. That's, That's our right. PTI. Got it. So if we run through both of those, if we walk that gauntlet, we've now said make sure that it has a good S election, meaning the right shareholders and stuff like that, and one class of stock. We said worry about stuff back when you were a C Corp, because that comes back to haunt you. Right. Right? Either did you pay your corporate tax on the appreciation? I say five years, you pointed out might be ten in California. Could be. And we worry about stuff where we didn't pay our dividend out. If we're able to get through that though, S Corps still have pretty substantial benefits. Could you walk through with us the glitches that exist in code section fourteen eleven? 
Well, so, so uh, Code Section 1411 is the net investment income tax. And so that's going to apply if you are a, uh, a passive shareholder. And to the extent that you're a passive shareholder of an S corporation, uh, which means that you don't materially participate in the S corporation, you're going to be subject to this 3.8% net investment income tax uh, on your income from the S corporation. Got it. And to the extent that I've got that tax, um, I understand that. And then I pay the other 3.8%, which is the self-employment tax, if I'm getting paid salary. That's right? right. But there's a glitch, which is in between the two, Congress, when they drafted the statute, didn't realize that you could materially participate in either an S Corp or a limited partnership. Right. And still get money in your role as an owner, which means you didn't pay the 3.8% SE tax, but darn, they didn't bring it in under the NII tax either. Right. So this glitch is there, and as I understand it, um, the stuff that shows up on your K-1 from an S Corp, if you worked more than 500 hours in the business, good news, it's not SE because it's a dividend. It's not NII because you materially participate. So everybody and their brother simply said, good, I'll drop my salary down to $2 a year, and all the rest is going to come out of my K-1, right? That's right. Now, we've seen the IRS attack unreasonable comp at C-Corp, saying, wait a minute, you're yeah. paying yourself way too much. With S-Corps, we're now seeing the attack where the IRS comes in and says, no way, you're paying yourself too little. Right? <laughs> exactly. And, I, you know, one of the problems there is that it's so much of it is based on, you know, if sort of the facts and circumstances. There's not a real good, bright line. Uh, the IRS issued a, um, uh, a statement in 2008, which, which sort of goes through the factors that it looks at in determining whether compensation is reasonable. So. Right. I would point out that if you're paying yourself below minimum wage for the hours you're working, you are beyond, I think Tesla would use the term, you're in ludicrous mode. So, <laughs> um, and then in terms of what you can explain as reasonable compensation, that's really facts and circumstances, but make sure you've gathered your documentation now. Don't wait till you get caught. That's right. That's right. Very, thank you. That's very helpful for S-Corps. You know, we also have major changes coming through for partnerships. We summarized these for our alumni last year, but boy, the rules are going to take effect January 1. So in addition to the prospective change in tax rates for business income coming through partnerships, we want to remind everyone that the Bipartisan Budget Act is still scheduled to take effect in 2018. Please note that it raises money for the government, and therefore it's unlikely that Congress is going to defer it. What's so scary is we know that the rules, as they're drafted, do not work, and we know the technical corrections has not yet gone through. The Treasury has issued hundreds of pages of regulations. Let me try to quickly summarize where we're at. Short version, these slides are identical to last fall's deck, is that corporate audits are easier for the IRS than partnership audits. It's the IRS's job to make sure all partners get notified, get a chance to participate, and more importantly, if there is a deficiency, the IRS has to go chase after every partner, and that might be up through multiple layers of flow-throughs. What the Bipartisan Budget Act does is it just reverses all that and says it's the partnership's problem to make sure that all partners get notice. It's the partnership's problem to make sure that all taxes get paid. And if anything goes wrong and the partnership doesn't take on its burden, then the IRS simply takes money out of the partnership's bank account. Now this is really frustrating for people who bought their partnership interest because they'd say, wait a minute, that should be the old partner's responsibility. But if it comes out of the partnership bank account, yeah. unless you got indemnified from the seller, you're the one who gets hurt. Yeah. What are the new rules? First of all, instead of a tax matters partner, you're supposed to appoint a partnership representative. An entity can be appointed, and there's articles saying just go ahead and appoint the partnership as though somehow that solves the problem. You still need to name a human being that the IRS is going to be able to rely on to make agreements on behalf of the partnership. And more importantly, a notice delivered to that partnership representative is a notice to all partners as far as the law is concerned. And it's, it doesn't have, I'm, I'm sorry, and it doesn't have to be a partner in the partnership. So it allows it, you can have a third. Uh, a, a third person uh, partnership representative. Right, and because there are many conflicts of interest between and among partners, you really want to be careful of that choice. If you fail to appoint one, there's actually a provision in the statute that says the IRS gets to choose one for you. 
I doubt they would choose one who'd really have all your best interests at heart. So <laughs> it's worth taking that pretty seriously. Um, and then basically, just treat it like a corporation. Net it all. If it's a plus number, charge tax. Most of the adjuncts I've spoken to have said, if we can get our clients out of BBA, that's what we want to do. There are very few fact patterns where anybody would want to early adopt for 2017 tax returns. However, there are a few weird fact patterns, mostly where you're more afraid of your investors than you are of the IRS. <laughs> and you just figure, yeah, if there's a problem, I'd rather deal with it at the entity level. The slide showing the decision tree is enormously important. If you can elect out of these rules, then you're just under the general small partnership rules, the every man for himself rules. Being able to elect out, we'll see, is fairly complicated. If you can't elect out, you might want to push your partners, get them to agree that they're going to amend their return. You might want to mitigate, meaning you might want to show the IRS that, hey, I've got some tax-exempt partners, so you shouldn't assess me at the top rate. And finally, you might want to say, let's make sure that all the original partners, the one who were in in the reviewed year, pay their tax and give a copy of their tax return. If you can't do those, though, the basic rule under BBA is the IRS can take the money straight out of the partnership's bank account. What does it take to be eligible for the election out? Well, the rules are pretty straightforward, but when you look at them, they're kind of goofy. For example, we've already mentioned that S-Corps can have trusts as uh, members, right? That's right. So curiously, a partnership can elect out if it has an S-Corp that has a trust up above it, but the same partnership can elect out if it just has the uh, trust up above it. Isn't that odd? Yeah. Yeah. We're definitely frustrated by that one, and a number of comments have been sent in to Treasury. The other one that seems really, really odd is a single member LLC is a disregarded entity under 7701. But curiously, it appears under the statute, it's not disregarded. So if I own my interest in the partnership through an S Corp, that's copacetic. I'm still eligible to elect out. But if I own it through a single member LLC, for some bizarre reason, it seems like, no, I'm stuck. Let's hope that we actually see either legislation or more favorable regs, but having a review with your partners of, do we need to do something to be eligible to elect out? The one that really has scared me the most is the fact that in order to elect out, you have to make the election every year in a timely filed return. And Barry G, I know a lot of informal partnerships, or let's say informal agreements that either share resources, that do research together, distribution agreements where we're sharing net profits. There are a lot of agreements yeah. that don't say partnership, but for tax purposes could be a partnership. I think that's right, and that's right to be, be scared on this. There's, you can have a contractual partnership. You may not quite be aware, and if, if you aren't yet aware that you've crossed that line into having a partnership, uh, you wouldn't know to file this election to elect out. Exactly. Now, once you do have um, the IRS come through, audit the partnership. If you weren't able to elect out, you might then say to the partners, please, original partners, go amend your returns, pay your tax, give me a copy. Partners might be a little bit reluctant to say, here, I'm going to give you a copy of my tax return. So this one can be harder than it seems. But if you're able to do that, the IRS is obligated to reduce rateably. So it's the partnership's job to prove, hey, the partner paid their tax on that adjustment. Otherwise, the partnership is going to be stuck. There's a second way of pushing it out, or I'm sorry, of keeping the IRS from collecting from the partnership, and that's if you make the push out election, where what the partners all agree is we're going to push that tax deficiency out to the original partners. So it's not the new kids, it's the guys who were in there in the year that there was a problem. Now, you can make this election, lenders may demand that you make this election, but know that it costs a little bit extra. There's an extra 2% per annum interest associated with it. But we've seen a number of partnerships talk about that and decide they are going to make that election. Once you're actually into an IRS audit, it's a tough time to get partners to agree. You probably want to talk before that. If you can't make that push out election, then you can mitigate. I don't have a separate slide on mitigation, but that's just do the best you can to demonstrate that, no, that's too much. And if you fail with that, expect that what's going to happen is you're going to go ahead and have the IRS taking money straight out of the partnership's bank account. What do people need to think about? Well, Barry, you and I began by talking about with C-Corp rates maybe going down to 
we get until March 15 of next year to decide if we wish we were a C Corp from day one. We probably don't want to do that planning next March. We probably want to be thinking about it before the end of the year. But asking our clients, do we really want to be a, um, a C corporation is worth asking. Also, if everybody's sharing rateably, aren't the S corp rules a little bit more favorable than the partnership rules? Certainly with respect to SE and NII tax. That's right. That's right. So I think, uh, you know, as, like you said, as long as everybody is sharing rateably and that, uh, you know, an S corporation, an S corporation vehicle uh, uh, with this potentially reduced tax rate, assuming that this tax reform passes, uh, might be a good way to go. So it's the same due date, right? Which is if we wish that we changed over to an S Corp uh, January 1 of 2018, we get the benefit of the lower rate, we might get this little SE NII benefit, but most importantly, we avoid all the craziness of BBA. That's right. A little bit That's scary, right. so we don't need to file both, both an 8832, the check a box, and the 2553. The IRS is happy, right, if we just send in the S form? That's right. Say it's both elections? That's right. So yeah. it's really easy to do, but if we do that, we've got to remember we're not going to get basis in our debt, and if we had debt in excess of our total basis, don't we trigger gain when we change from a partnership to an S corp? That's right, if your excess is um, yeah, in excess. That's yeah, right. 357C yeah. would be my yeah. guess. So the decision to incorporate doesn't simply mean incorporate and pay the 20% C corp tax rates. It could be incorporate, make an S election, and then avoid the BBA rules fall under the S-Corp rules that Barry ran through, you might be much happier with that as a result. If we're going to be modeling this before the end of the year and watching it, the final thing I think we'd say for both partnerships and S-Corps is look at all the things we talked about in our business slide deck, right? That's defer right. income because the tax rates might be lower. Maybe defer purchases of depreciable property. Maybe accelerate deductions. That's right, exactly. Barry, this has been enormously helpful. Any last words of wisdom you'd give for our friends out there? You know, I, I would say that uh, as the end of the year approaches, this is a great time to do your sort of the house the housekeeping for your S, uh, S corporation. Um, you know, I, I think that these things may, may not arise, some of the issues that we've talked about here may not arise in the context of an IRS audit, but they could arise uh, if your uh, S corporation is undergoing any transactions, whether it's a purchase, uh, purchase or a sale. So, um, definitely things to keep in mind. And since you work in an M&A type practice, let me guess, you're the pound of cure as opposed to the ounce of prevention. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Wonderful. Hey, Barry, thanks so much for joining. Fred, thank you for having me. I appreciate it.